Um, hello, everyone. I'm McLean Clutter. I'm the chair of the architecture program here at Taubman College. Uh, and you've made it to the last panel of the day, uh, which is titled Design Where You Least Expect It, which is intended to discuss the capacities of designers, those being architects, landscape architects, and urban designers, to operate within the context of deindustrialized and abandoned territories. Although I think we've already heard some uh, potential tactics and the presence of design in other presentations or other panels already. So in this panel, we're asking what old categories of thought become an encumbrance and what new approaches and affinities need to be cultivated? Is it opportunistic to identify opportunity? In the absence of surplus capital, what materials and media are mobilized? In the absence of an RFP, what new roles uh, of instigation emerge as part of the design practice? Who designs and who is designed for? Uh, so I'll keep the introductions really brief here because the longer uh, uh, bios, of course, are all in the, the program that you have. But first, we'll hear from Julie Bargman. Julie is a professor of landscape architecture at the University of Virginia and a founder of Dirt Studio. After that, we'll hear from Cyrus Penaroyo. Cy Cyrus is an assistant professor of architecture here at Taubman College and a partner in the architecture practice extents. Disclosure, I am also a partner in the architecture practice extent, so I'm not an impartial um, moderator today. And finally, we'll hear from Kathy Velikoff and Jeff Ritoon. Kathy is an associate professor of architecture here at Taubman and a partner in the research-based practice RVTR. And Jeff is an associate professor of architecture as well. Uh, and again, uh, a partner in RVTR. He is also our Associate Dean for Research and Creative Practice. So first we'll hear from Julie. There we go, here I am. Okay, hi, it's really great to be here. Um, I tell everyone that my, almost my entire huge family went to school here, in fact two nephews are in the house. Woohoo! Um, anyway, so my finest hour, I think maybe as a fledgling designer when maybe I was like eight years old, my father would have us, you know, a Wolverine, would help us dis uh, um, uh, decorate the house for the Michigan Ohio State game. And my proudest moment was when I took a, a sticker saying gold, go blue and put it on the toilet. So my, uh, qu the questions that I have following on the others is where do we find room for design when the work of in fallow territory actually has non-designers at the front of the line? Um, <laughs> my thing is not doing, hold on. I'm good, I'm good. thanks. Uh, and then how does a designer communicate the value of, I will be partial here, of landscape-based strategies and how to carve out room for design, period. And how does a uh, design practice, I think, become opportunistic with the ability to cut in front of these characters? I have spent over the you know, 28 years that I've been in practice banging heads with corporate manufacturers, wrestling with regulators, the EPA or a city official, negotiating with an environmental engineer, even though he just was a cartoon character. Not this guy, I haven't dealt with him, but you do have to plea with the developer to do the right thing, and unfortunately, sometimes you have to tell a community uh, that they're basically uh, poisoned, and you have to uh, ask neighbors to see fallow um, as full. All pretty dif difficult tasks. So um, I have asked myself, how did I get here? And I've asked, how do I practice? And sometimes I asked, why do I practice? Um, so I'm going to be sharing a couple old projects, maybe to kind of see the trajectory um, of, of efforts to work with uh, industrial land, post-industrial land, and a couple current ones to reflect, um, to reflect this uh, trajectory of finding room for design. 
Um, and I would like to talk about several methodologies. And one is to um, acknowledge that design uh, can be casting a course of action. Um, and uh, with a project with the artist Mel Chin, we had dealt with what I, I, I love in this drawing that Mel did. He talked about the disaster before the disaster, which you will see what you're seeing lurking under Katrina there um, is, um, is a lead map. So Mel called me and said, we need to devise a way to ad um, address these leaded soils that are spread across the entire city uh, of New Orleans. Um, and of course, we helped with the baseline task of masking the geography of lead. But we also knew, because you know, I learned how it is that you know, we all know, but how important, especially in an area that is, people don't think is your ex uh, expertise, being able to tell them something um, and you know, being clear that, OK, we understand 400 parts per million is the EPA standard. But hold on a second, 100 parts per million is poisonous. So something a little wrong with the picture. So then you kind of raise the bar for them. We also got to work with another scientist. You're going to see that I, um, the scientist and science has become key uh, in the work. Um, and they, he was uh, um, working on the recipe um, to basically render lead non-bioavailable, which you do with um, a phosphate amendment to the leaded soils. Um, and this was really when we started to say, OK, how do we, how do we distribute this across the city at many different uh, uh, scales with very different characters along the way? So there was also a topping of clean sediment that we put on um, the amended soils uh, from the Bonnet Carey spillway. So they already had the active ingredients. Um, and here was our nested scale of action. Today, I've actually kind of seen this kind of like roller coaster through a lot of scales. And I've, I've realized that, you know, one of the reasons we did this was to literally break it down, you know, to know like, okay, you know, um, yeah, just who do you really engage at the different scales? Um, and how do you get action happen at every different scale from the extra large depots um, to the extra large, um, the extra small uh, neighbors' yards. So, uh, so this is at Saint Rock, um, and uh, it turned into a mud square. We called it. It's at the middle scale. Um, it's at the scale of the wheelbarrow. Dick's scale down is a shovel. Um, and I just want to point out that we did not design the landscape per se. Um, we just designed the course of action. Um, and I just, again, it's about learning, um, valuing, and collabor uh, calibrating the action uh, to be effective um, at all different scales. Um, oops, sorry, I got it. Um, so I can't, I can't stop doing the talking heads thing. So you find yourself in front of a large automobile. Um, and it was made by the factory that also contaminated the soils. And of course, you want to uh, talk straight to these polluters, but I actually have learned to do end arounds. Not very nice thing to teach your students, but what the hell. So um, here, a 1,000 acres of uh, the Rouge is joined by thousands and thousands of manufacturing acres in Detroit. And so, um, and as uh, Mona um, alluded to, uh, it was my landscape architect and ecologist friend, Christina Hill, that was talking about increase those acres ever more as um, the subsurface toxins or are going to be, um, are going to, you know, uh, rear their ugly head with climate change. But in this case, I, we, we learned about making different arguments and almost representing the, representing in this case, Ford's landscape to themselves, you know, um, and the and actually here my other thing of the front, with science is art is is history. Um, so we made a cultural argument and we made an environmental pitch, both, um, and we actually convinced or pressured Ford um, into manufacturing clean dirt as a part of their legacy. 
Um, the cultural argument saved the Coke ovens that are in the background. The environmental pleas foregrounded what you see is a nascent bio biotechnology of phytoremediation, which of course is a, now a household word, but this was 20 years ago. We put this out into the world and open to the public. Um, and I think it's it, these, these designed experiments, um, not a lot of design here, uh, but strategies, design experience, uh, experiments like this that advance academia into the field. Um, I am going to be showing a small project uh, to illustrate work with my, you know, that I've been working with for a long time on industrial sites. Um, it's a methodology that I think has become more and more clear to me um, as I work on them, um, it, that it's a process of curation, it's one of finding, of careful editing, and most of all, restraint. Um, this is Core City Park, just north of Corktown. Um, which is full of modest um, one-story and two-story industrial buildings, ones that are prevalent across um, uh, Detroit and are embedded in the Detroit neighborhoods. It's not always the megafauna like the River Rouge that is divorced from uh, their neighbors. Uh, with these industries, um, with these industries across the street and embedded, you know, this, the site histories become quite intimate. Um, so I find there's kind of a, a gentle handling, um, just, you know. Uh, and uh, in Core City, um, what you see there was, was in, on, in this site, right, was a local firehouse amongst all those manufacturing. And this was when I love historic photographs um, because then I begin to have a hunch about what those site histories may take form. Um, and so the strategy was one of simply digging. I said, what are you gonna do? And I had no drawing, no nothing. I said, let's dig. Um, and literally the park emerged and you are actually seeing this weird moment when the, the uh, cornerstone of the firehouse came up. So my client was ecstatic and I, so I just kind of re you know, increased my fee right then. So. Um, but just simple things like this, um, that so that the, the you know, that the, um, the park wasn't too fancy pants, you know, um, and, you know, we, we bashed holes and planted trees to form a dense urban um, woodland. And so the idea was really to remain resourceful, which actually I think uh, um, there's something that a lot of trust comes with that, uh, being resourceful. Um, and it also helps the um, project feel familiar in kind of an odd way. Uh, it's open ground and it's actually become a catalyst uh, and a magnet, excuse me, that's a pun on the restaurant that's right there, uh, for the entire neighborhood, which, which actually I'm really lucky I'm working on the entire neighborhood plan. Um, uh, and <laughs> So I'm gonna contradict myself here. Um, so as much as I like making parks, I don't believe parks are the answer uh, for, uh, not the only answer. Uh, because I wanna, I've been wanting to start an argument about parkland. Um, parkland encompasses all types of landscapes, in fact, and the re predominant being larger tracts of the fallow. Um, and with a, de uh, uh, with a debt to Jill DeSimony and along with Matthew Gandy, I've really um, kind of learned a lot about reframing this vague terrain um, and it might enable us to begin to name and claim this vague terrain um, and this other type of landscape. Um, we can learn, uh, whoop, I mean two things, that, we can learn from the Germans, which we have a lot today, um, who somehow, maybe you can explain this to me, Krista, have a special a relationship with spontaneous vegetation. What's up with that? Um, we can learn from um, the French, uh, namely Gilles Clement, uh, landscape architect, uh, to understand what he calls the third landscape, that that is the future. Uh, and we can learn from our northern neighbors, Canadians that 
Reframing can be as simple as an unprogrammed occupation. We're learning that this is possible. Um, so the sites hold promise, but how can designers instigate, I would say, an entire system of parkland? I mean, we're going back to like maybe my fantasies of being dead Fred, you know, Olmstead, sorry, and thinking about these uh, landscapes in a systematic way. Um, so I am gonna show some maps. Um, my students and I took a stab at what the system could look, uh, would look like in Detroit. But we did, it, it came from first looking at neighborhoods, all different neighborhoods, um, at a very intimate scale. Um, and so we looked um, at a system that operates at the city and also one at the neighborhood. So the larger city system uh, begins with the wiring that's there. And then, it's so funny because I, I had to make my, st my students needed to do this several times, but I said, St you know, come on, come on, you know, like, because they didn't want to be land grabbers. I'm like, come on, be right. And, uh, but you can see here how they were like, okay, we'll go down with this uh, robust system of, c of city land. Um, and this would be, the idea here that w w this system would be, uh, you know, pretty, um, robust and it would remain public in perpetuity um, as contrast to um, neighborhood parkland. Um, and again, uh, this map was generated not from the outside but all came from the inside of looking at the neighborhood, neighborhoods um, and the specific conditions. The, the, the students actually came up with this idea that it, let's call it neighborhood parkland because it actually has people living within it. Um, understanding the low density, that it doesn't have to be completely clear that, in fact, when there's a few residents, that might be most significant. Um, and the idea also was that um, uh, this parkland, city in, hold on. There's the pink one, okay. So, this is one where people, you know, know about ar archipelagos, but it was great to see him, them arrive at that, you know, um, and to see that, yes, there's something about, like, these dense cores and this kind of uh, other um, more uh, uh, connective parkland. Uh, one of my students poured parkland into low density in Core City uh, to glue, she called it, to glue the community together. Um, another, uh, another, albeit maybe a little bit too um, timidly, uh, violated an old commercial corridor, Van Dyke, uh, by sliding big parkland slabs um, out into the oversized street. Um, one uh, working in Jefferson Chalmers was really interested in the extra long blocks and these alleys that had become, um, had become hedgerows. So they had, it was turned into a very, very dis distinct landscape type. So we worked on these proto prototypes of landscapes to be specific about making parkland. Um, I also am, I am into very much into name it and claim it. Um, and I think you yeah, almost have to name and claim, especially the found landscapes. Um, here's, uh, underneath there is a track and that's gonna be the Joe Lewis Greenway. Um, and I bet you anything those sumac are gone. Damn it. Um, so these landscapes are growing according to their own logic, not ours, which is maybe why people don't like them. Um, and they're championed by scientists for their ecological value. Um, I think this is a funny, I like to think it's a funny spoof on constructed wetlands. wetlands. Uh, but these are landscapes that are, the landscapes are opportunistic and I think designers should be that opportunistic. And so I am, uh, this is a, you know, early sketch about Core City uh, in making parkland um, system there. Um, the developer there has committed to uh, uh, making 85% of the neighborhood parkland only develop 15% of it. Um, and um, the other goal, um, so that one goal is regenerating the, the neighborhood and the other is for D Detroiters to see their fallow land as full, not empty. Thank you.
I can end with that. <laughs> Hi. So um, I am here today, um, well, thank you first to the organizers of the symposium, Maria, for extending the invitation. Um, I'm here today to present uh, this project called Online On Site, um, which is a mapping-based research and design project that studies the digital divide in Detroit. Uh, proposing urban design scenarios that are rich with innovative ways to connect physically and virtually. Um, this research was originally funded by the Mellon, Michigan Mellon Project on the Egalitarian Metropolis. Uh, and before I dive in, I want to begin by saying that it's not the goal of the project to just find solutions, uh, nor is it to craft wildly improbable urbanisms. Uh, rather, the project takes a resourceful and opportunistic approach to design research in an attempt to outline a new cultural imaginary for the digital infrastructure that's shaping our cities. So <clears throat> I am by no means an expert in all aspects of internet infrastructure, so I'm not sure I'll be able to answer all of your questions. But to begin this project, I did engage uh, many voices in the city, uh, local high school students, members of the Detroit Community Technology Project, creative industry representatives, and government officials. Um, in conversations with all of the above, it became apparent that while they share a, uh, share a desire uh, for resilient digital infrastructure that allows everyone to get online, they sometimes have competing desires or conflicting opinions about how to achieve that goal. Online on-site takes on the difficult task of navigating disparate points of view and bringing them together in design proposals that engage the social, political, and physical realities of existing sites. Um, and this research was prompted by two recent developments, the FCC's repeal of net neutrality and the Census Bureau's decision to move our data collection online for the 2020 survey. In both cases, for one to be counted or to exist, requires access to digital technology, which is a problem for those unable to afford internet, computers, or smart devices. And Detroit is one of many places in the United States where this digital inequity persists. As investors pour money into the residential and commercial development of areas like downtown, midtown, or Corktown, Cork residents in marginalized neighborhoods lack access to digital infrastructure. Indeed, despite recent development, Detroit has the lowest rate of internet connectivity in the United States. Something like 40% of residents don't have access to internet which excludes thousands of people from the opportunities for education, employment, and belonging afforded to those with the ability to get online, and exacerbating the economic precarity of many Detroiters. Um, referred to as digital redlining, some view disinvestment in digital infrastructure for less affluent, non-white communities as commensurate to discrimination. Many of those affected are school-aged kids that need the internet to complete their homework, submit job applications, or simply socialize with their classmates. Uh, to give you an idea, about three million kids across the country don't have adequate internet. Uh, statistics show that in places where high-speed internet is made available, more people earn college degrees, fewer people are unemployed, and the rates of poverty tend to be lower. And various political and grassroots organizations like Detroit's Equitable Internet Initiative, seen here, are working to build a robust digital ecosystem as urban development is increasingly influenced by broadband or wireless accessibility. And to do this, the EII is establishing community mesh networks across the city. Uh, but what exactly is a mesh network? Well, first, let's talk plainly about how internet connections work and why people don't have them. Typically, we access the internet via broadband, uh, an enormous cable that connects our ISP, or internet service provider, with top-level internet exchanges. In 2015, the FCC defined broadband as internet with download speeds of at least 25 megabits per second and upload speeds of at least three megabits per second. And that basically means a constant connection capable of streaming videos, sending emails or text messages, and transferring data on multiple devices. And here I'm talking about fixed broadband, which is different from mobile broadband like 4G, which is basically what you have on your cell phone. And ISPs like AT&T, Verizon, and Sprint are investing heavily in their, broadband, uh, their mobile broadband, which means that companies like Comcast or Charter, which own Spectrum, are likely to provide you with your uh, fixed broadband connection. In cities, most broadband is wireline, which typically means that it's transmitted through fiber optic cables installed underground. It's expensive to lay cables, but this cost isn't a problem for providers in dense urban areas because hundreds of people are subscribing to the same network. This presents a challenge, however, to rural areas, or in this project, low density and less, less affluent areas. Why should large telecompanies like AT&T or Comcast prioritize extending cable lines to only a few subscribers? The alternative is wireless broadband, which is either beamed from a satellite or relayed by antennas from the nearest fixed wireless point. But this option presents its own challenges. 
So if the left shows our typical relationship to ISPs, mesh networks on the right connect devices directly to each other instead of going through a central point, which allows for more flexibility based on available bandwidth and storage. And since mesh networks are decentralized and non-hierarchical, the only way to shut down or disrupt a mesh is to turn off every node in the network, making them more resilient to interference. Each node is programmed with software that tells it how to, how to interact within a larger framework, and in a process known as dynamic routing, the nodes are able to automatically choose the quickest and safest path. The more nodes you install, the bigger and faster the network becomes. Um, other examples of meshes from around the world include NYC Mesh or Red Hook Wi-Fi in New York, Ninex in Italy, the people's own network in Oakland, um, and Freifunk in Germany. And each of these networks re rely on their own economic and social infrastructure and operate differently. But the basic premise is the same, this idea of distributing internet connection across node clusters. Um, the nodes, referred to as community anchor sites, include schools, libraries, municipal buildings, and other stakeholders in the neighborhood with the resources, access to fiber, and willingness to form public-private partnerships. So in this diagram, you see everything from schools to libraries to um, apartment buildings and municipal buildings. Uh, and these com community mesh networks allow residents to establish their own intranet, which features local information and neighborhood-specific apps that co and communication channels, which uh, becomes useful in times of emergency or when people were uh, prefer to protect their data. Um, in a community-driven network architecture, factories, apartments, and houses are outfitted with different routers, turning buildings into access points for residents to get online. And all of this information comes from wildly available manuals that people could download to install mesh networks in their own neighborhoods. Um, telecommunication signals are based on the electromagnetic radiation spectrum which means that data transmission depends on distance and signal frequency. And the placement of the routers is based on line of sight. For the network to function, airspace has to be clear of obstructions, including trees and signage. Taller buildings can act as long span nodes to link different areas of the neighborhood, while shorter buildings can distribute Wi-Fi access more locally and allow people to connect with their phones, laptops, or tablets. In other words, mesh networks are highly attuned to the physical attributes of the urban environment. Heights, proximities, and materials play a pivotal role in the network success. Um, so even things like uh, concrete actually um, prevent Wi-Fi signal from uh, transferring, and it's much easier to transfer signal through things like wood or glass. Um, so these are all the things that I'm sort of collecting and looking at um, as, I, as I begin to formulate this project. Um, so once I educated myself on the technology required for internet infrastructure, I started to look at maps charting internet coverage across the US more broadly and Detroit more specifically. Accuracy or the value oh. of the map is nearly nil in my view. These maps. Oops, that shouldn't be. Well. Anyways, there shouldn't be sound on the video. Um, however, I soon realized that the way the FCC allocates funds to areas in need um, is based on bad maps. The FCC asks companies to fill out Form 477, which lets ISPs self report. Accuracy or the value of the map Sorry. is. Friend, which lets ISPs self-report on how many people they're serving. So to use an example from the Netflix show Patriot Act, which was, that video was from, and their episode on internet inequality, which I highly recommend, if a company tells the FCC that one household in a census block has broadband, then the FCC rounds up and assumes that the entire block has broadband. And it's inaccuracies like this that have, that have major consequences. The FCC's bad data helps determine what areas get money from the Universal Service Fund, which is $4.5 billion that Congress can allocate to guarantee that all Americans have telecom services, including internet. But you can't effectively distribute this money if communities are grossly misrepresented. So when studying Detroit in search, in search of truthful representation, I knew I'd have to develop a cartographic approach that could cut across multiple data sets and constituencies, as well as incorporate on the ground anecdotes and narratives, a sort of thick mapping that goes beyond the data to incorporate empirical observations. And so as I began mapping Detroit, I charted fiber availability to show its consolidation in the downtown area, potential anchors like public libraries, religious institutions, schools, and Wi-Fi equipped restaurants or cafes that could participate in a com community mesh network, the number of internet service providers available to residents, uh, most of the city has le uh, three or less options, and maximum download speed, which is remarkably slow. All of this data was examined in relation to the city's history of redlining, and this led me to look at race distribution, median household income, unemployment rate, and of course the youth population. And after reviewing all of this data, 
Uh, three sites were chosen for design speculation, each revealing uh, a different opportunity for a community-driven network architecture to exist. Um, and to reiterate this transition from data collection to design proposition, um, it's not about providing a solution to the city's connectivity problem, rather it's about understanding what role architecture might play in the problem and revealing opportunities for different stakeholders to come together around shared concerns. Um, so with each of the locations, um, there's a high youth population, um, there's also three or less internet service providers available in each of, those, each of these locations, and then um, with each, there's a different mix or combination of socioeconomic data that's being used. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that each site presents a different opportunity to explore issues at the scale of a building, uh, a block, and a neighborhood. So um, now I'm gonna talk about the sites in more detail. Um, each site is anchored by a public library, which is noted on the maps with a pink plus center. Uh, the same symbols from the larger maps uh, that I showed before um, reappear on these zoomed in versions. So um, the yellow circles are uh, churches or religious institutions, and then of course, um, the McDonald's. Um, and a half mile radius from the public library is used to determine the perimeter or edge of each uh, site speculation. So the first site is located in southwest Detroit, and here's a Google Earth aerial view. Uh, and it features religious institutions and locally owned businesses that together could form a possible mesh network. And in my interviews with local high school students, I learned that many of them go to McDonald's or are advised to go to McDonald's for the 24 hour Wi Fi access when they don't have internet at home. Um, I also, in my research, uh, came across um, an example from Coachella Valley, California, where they've converted buses into mobile hotspots at night. So um, after the buses have taken students to their respective um, homes, the buses are then equipped with Wi-Fi routers and then distributed in the neighborhood to provide internet access to, um, for, for students to, to, to do their homework. So this first site, site speculation reimagines McDonald's as a community anchor site. Uh, and this diagram shows line of sight for ideal connectivity with other nodes in the network. And this is uh, using a technique that um, the EII uses in Detroit to actually um, determine uh, the best place to, to locate um, routers um, th in a, throughout a neighborhood. Um, an existing McDonald's, which you kind of see here, is converted into what I refer to as the McNett Learning Center an educational space that provides computers, tutoring services, and workstations to students. An abandoned home just north of the site is replaced with communal townhouses oriented towards the restaurant with shared outdoor spaces that transition from the commercial thoroughfare to the residential block. An urban farm is introduced to an adjacent lot, so the surrounding neighborhood and the restaurant have access to fresh produce, a direct response to the McDonald's Corporation's recent attempts to offer healthier menu options and become more community-centered some close-up shots of the proposal. Um, also in my research, um, I was informed about the, um, the access to internet at the Detroit uh, main public library um, and how actually people park in the parking lot uh, and feed off of the free Wi-Fi um, from, uh, from inside. And uh, they do that to actually stream uh, Netflix and watch things online. Uh, so it's become this kind of alternative drive-in in a way. And, and so this, this proposal um, tries to take that idea and um, see what would happen if you converted the park, a normal parking lot outside of McDonald's into these sort of soft parking areas where people could uh, stream content off of um, these sort of public Wi-Fi antennas. And this is a view inside of the addition to the McDonald's showing study areas facing a new school bus drop off. The second site is located in northeast Detroit and it's bisected by a major highway and next to a defunct golf course which you can see in the, the lower half of the slide. And this side, uh, slide again shows line of sight from the public library and ultimately the abundance of trees in the area. Again, trees interfere with signal strength. Uh, the neighborhood, which has a significant amount of vacant land, this is what it would look like if you um, were to clear all of the vacant properties or vacant, vacant houses, um, is in this proposal re-envisioned as a network defined by social and cultural programs. Unoccupied houses and industrial buildings are converted into religious institutions, which happens already um, throughout the neighborhood. Uh, community centers, banks, and businesses are redistributed into residential blocks, and new housing types are developed with shared space and internet access in mind. As trees are cleared to maintain sight lines for the Wi-Fi, um, and to reduce interference, the defunct golf course is transformed into a, an urban forest. Now, I think it's important to reiterate here that it's, again, not totally or literally about clearing trees out and moving them to create the forest. Uh, the proposal gets us to ask more questions about our built environment. Um, so I wouldn't take this proposal 
totally seriously. Um, it's really about asking like why the golf course, why the tree-lined streets, why the commercial activity consolidated on one street, and it purposely operates in this space between reality and fiction. Some close-up shots of some of the housing typologies. And then this is one example, a kind of ring of duplexes that's, that surround an empty, um, an empty yard that has access to um, shared Wi-Fi. Um, the third and final site is located in northwest Detroit, along Grand River Avenue, a commercial thoroughfare lined with hair salons, markets, convenience stores, and automotive shops. Uh, between three major anchor sites in the neighborhood's potential mesh network, uh, two blocks are developed as a community land trust, where, where property lines are dissolved in favor of shared Wi-Fi and resources. We heard about community land trust from earlier today. Um, but so if this is uh, the existing site and the dark blue um, highlighted buildings are, are actually vacant buildings, um, those buildings are converted into computer equipped daycares, greenhouses, and barber shops owned and managed by residents living in the area. The wing of an, of an existing church is transformed into a tech hub where both seniors and youth can get online. And an adjacent community center will supply internet access to the blocks in addition to a nearby closed school sitting on dark fiber that can be reactivated. Some shots of the neighborhood. And then if we look at this diagram and remove the trees for just a second, um, cords and cables are consolidated into fiber optic berms uh, that cut through the site, creating civic spaces for residents to gather in various ways. Um, and this is taking inspiration from Wolfgang Schivelbusch's Disenchanted Night series, um, a series of illustrations that show kind of public assembly around public utilities. And here is a view of one of those berms next to the urban farm. And all of the maps and proposals were compiled into videos that also featured my interviews with Detroit youth. These students shared how the internet influences their identities, daily routines, and expectations of the city. The videos were first presented in an exhibition alongside other Michigan Mellon funded projects mapping Detroit. And here um, in this exhibition, the, the data points are literally materialized as content nodes around, uh, within the gallery for visitors to engage. In addition to sharing this work in other venues, including the recent um, Shenzhen Biennale, I'm further developing this research at the building scale now, uh, partnering with the City of Detroit Department of Innovation and Technology, engineers, and a local church looking to better serve their neighborhood. Um, and so now the, the project has moved beyond beyond um, just pure kind of design speculation and into soliciting and testing some of these ideas with actual community members. So um, to conclude, uh, I recognize that the in Equitable Internet Initiative are not urban designers and that there's a difference between what I do as an architect and urban designer and what they do as activists and community organizers. My project does not offer solutions per se. Uh, instead, it identifies latent opportunities within Detroit and explores spatial, material, and technological strategies across multiple scales. And while the EII is continuing to establish internet infrastructure in various neighborhoods across the city, my work looks more broadly at digital access and equity in our urban environments and tries to put these important issues on the table for designers to address moving forward. Again, the project tries to cultivate a new cultural imaginary for cities and digital technology. Though the EII's efforts have been widely published, and this project certainly owes a great debt to their work, it doesn't mean that questions around digital access or virtual belonging have been uh, resolved, or that architects and urbanists are entirely aware of the problem. If anything, a closer look at the project reveals the larger systemic issues at play in getting people to connect and relate both physically and virtually. As our cities get smarter and urban development is increasingly influenced by internet accessibility, uh, designers will need to critically engage the role that technology plays in shaping the built environment. And as the project is received and evolves, I hope it will create a heightened sense of community, empower citizens to create new spaces for public discourse in their neighborhoods, and redefine what digital access and equity could look like in our cities. Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> We're uh, approaching the, the end here. Um, through this talk, operating through temporalities of territory and social infrastructure, Kathy and I are going to speak a little bit about two speculative design projects that scale from the territory to the city block. 
Yeah, and these are both kind of thought experiments and, and prototypical working methodologies for post or deindustrializing urban territories. So the urban territory is a social landscape in a continual state of transformation. We heard a lot about this um, in the uh, presentations today. It's characterized by constant making and remaking, unmaking and making again. And its elements and agents operate at different speeds. The slow speed of geology, the, um, the seasonal speed of climate, the boom and bust of industry, the rapid flicker of technology and the cycles of human daily life. And deindustrialized territories present other specific speeds to contend with. That is, again, the slow speed of concrete infrastructures, of land divisions that seem to, to stick, um, the half-life of toxic substances, the rapid pace of decampment, of social destabilization, and the growth of weeds. Forester, planner, and conservationist Benton Mackay, who along with um, Lewis Mumford was uh, regarded one of the founders of regional planning in the, in the US, argued that industrialized territory constitutes a, a, kind, of, um, a, a kind of new wilderness, a renewed frontier for exploration in which geography, which is mapping, plans, sections, charting, constitutes um, a, a kind of form of discovery, and, and that might explain why you've seen quite a bit of mapping uh, today uh, as part of all the projects across, uh, across institutions. And um, uh, as designers, um, the, this idea is central in our work, and, and we're gonna start with a, a project that's a slightly older project, which is our work on the Great Lakes mega region um, called Infraecology Urbanism. And this is a design and research project that works on questions of urban society within the mega region, where mapping kind of constitutes an integral part of the design con con process and becomes a way for us to uncover, reveal, and communicate new narratives of the territory and to consider practices um, through which the infrastructural, ecological, economic, and logistical logics of the periphery um, can, in, in, can um, inspire and, and, and instruct a, kind of, a different kind of design proposition. In this project, we develop thick mappings at the regional scale that we term sheds, and which gather interrelated geographic, logistical, economic, and infrastructural agents that figure urbanization within the mega region. Each shed attempts to build a layered narrative based on the spatial agents actively shaping the mega region and working to coalesce as legible territory, simultaneously overlaying geographic data, such as geology and soil type, with sites of production, corporate or institutional actors, vectors of material flow, and in scales of, and intensities of activity. But for us, mapping is only part of the representational assemblage that we utilize to apprehend and think the territory. We also assemble inventories or taxonomies of physical objects and uh, typologies that shape and structure the territory, such as in this case, forms of highway interstate changes, uh, and also direct actor networks of the governing bodies, institutions, organizations, uh, individuals, codes, legislation, treaties, and funding mechanism that constitute the apparatus as a specific infrastructural location uh, that surround and produce a specific place context within the system. And Henri Lefebvre, who among the many um, smart things he said, also said that work on the urban cannot limit itself to merely recording what has been produced. We must also look ahead and propose things. And so this, um, this is the uh, imperative of much of our urban work is to also explore, demonstrate, and prototype possibilities for how infrastructure can be reconceived and to move beyond kind of, and one of the Im imperatives and the way that we think about it is how do we think about infrastructure um, beyond single use, single purpose infrastructure, and how can it operate as, as social infrastructure? And there, in the US, there has been a tradition of referring to infrastructural projects undertaken as a kind of cooperation between federal and state governments as public works, and becoming, beginning with a broad range of, of transportation-related internal improvements, these works included to include 
public service infrastructures as well as public buildings, schools, hospitals, municipal buildings. And so it's interesting that all of these buildings are actually thought of as uh, an infrastructure in this um, 1940s poster from the, from the WPA. Um, and this notion of public works also goes beyond um, infrastructural efficiencies and effectiveness to a kind of conceptualization of infrastructure that has the capacity to produce new community, recreational, public, and public space systems. Moreover, this conceptualization implies the possibility of combining service infrastructures and public spaces, as can be seen here in the infrastructural recreational projects of the Tennessee Valley Authority, where a large series of dam and water management projects were coupled with the development of new recreational public spaces and buildings. Or Benton Mackay's vision for the Appalachian Trail as an organizational spine for public access and public utility, connecting transportation, hydroelectric networks, coal mining and communities, while also serving as a fire break and lookout for forest fires. In contemporary practice, some of the most successful and resilient infrastructural projects are ones planned and realized in a combination with public access and amenity. Our project speculates upon this idea of a regionally scaled infrastructural corridor and posits a utopistic scenario where the anticipated yield of near future renewable energy is leveraged towards common ends by reworking infrastructural systems, organizations, and architectures of the urban periphery. And um, just, uh, this is actually within this project, we actually imagined a kind of Canada-US Shenzhen <laughs> that Scott uh, imagined that, that would be coalesced around questions of an energy transmission in the, I mean, energy transformation in the Great Lakes, as well as environmental and water questions of, of the Great Lakes. In this detourment, the highway is retooled to transform from a simple single purpose and single access surface into an intelligent network of bundled high-speed rail mobility, energy and service, water and waste transfer, grid tied to energy development. Networked with other systems of transit and transport, it forms an open and interconnected corridor that catalyzes and connects regional industries, local communities, environments, and new architectures along the line. Along the length of the highway, large-scale developments are strategically implemented at existing sites of interchange, and these new interchange nodes become critical points of transfer, congregation, and exchange. They not only organize multi-flows as multimodal hubs, but house new hybrid mega-regional institutions to form future public spaces and iconic forms within this ex-urban context, producing a kind of metropolitanism for the periphery. Detailed proposals are developed for sites at Chicago, Detroit, and Toronto, each of which couple physical infrastructure investment with the production of new cultural spaces, landscape systems, and models for formal social infrastructure enabled through the collective dividends of renewable energy sources. And after this project, um, we started to think um, more closely on, um, on Detroit in the, in the region and, uh, and uh, in bringing our viewpoint closer to um, to, to, the, to, the, to the actual city of Detroit and thinking about how this, um, the process and the thinking from this, the, the InfraEco Lodge Urbanism Project will shift as we change scale in, into the city. And the city of, the urban condition of Detroit is characterized um, by drastically uneven development, as we've heard um, uh, since last night and, and all day today, comprised of large areas of dispossession and marginalization um, within a highly asymmetrical distribution of urban services between neighborhoods. And these conditions of injustice and exclusion from core social and economic orders go beyond the kind of conventional discourses of inequality, and they really implicate networks of systems, institutions, um, ins and instruments uh, that operate through a kind of le logics of complexity. And these systems are not only social, they're um, in terms of policies and services, but they're also spatial. And they manifest in um, some of the uh, urban practices of, of, of abandonment, lack of, and, as well as lack of investment and impoverished public space. But Detroit was not always like this. As US cities, such as Detroit, were planned and grew in the 19th and 20th centuries, social infrastructures were distributed within the urban fabric. 
The Jefferson Platting Plan, which defined the growth pattern of many cities, was conceived as a grid of main streets along which businesses and infrastructures such as grocery stores, banks, pharmacies, restaurants, and gathering spaces were organized. And then housing filled in the balance of the, of the block figure where in the center uh, was typically located an edu educational institution uh, such as a school and recreational parks, a diagram that underscored an aspiration to equitable access to core social needs underlying uh, the planning structures of the time. While structured around radiating linear systems of production and mobility, the principles of this plotting plan formed much of how we can read Detroit's urban patterns during its peak occupancy. For example, if we look at the Jefferson Chalmers neighborhood on Detroit's east side, indicated here with a red rectangle, Analysis of the Sanborn fire insurance maps of 1949 shows a density of urban services along the main streets and a school in the middle of the neighborhood. On either side of Jefferson, uh, last night Spent, Lord Lester Spence talked about 90 uh, children per block and this is a kind of moment where that density of residential occupancy produced that kind of uh, cultural density. Although not every building uses identified on the map, grocery stores, restaurants, lunch counters for the workers at the nearby Chrysler plant, as well as pharmacies, banks, shops, and a gas station of every corner are indicated from this period of history. This is drastically different to the urban analysis of social infrastructures that exist there today, witnessing the disappearance of public institutions, both schools in the middle of the neighborhood are now demolished, and the privatization of urban access through commercial enterprise. As the urban territory is always in a state of transformation, especially with regard to urban services and industries, we began to experiment with dynamic forms of mapping that layer contextual information and access enabling agents. Okay. Yeah, and through um, grant funding uh, through Ford Motor Company, as well as the Michigan Mellon on the um, egalitarian metropolis, we developed the urban access mapping tool, which uses near real-time data scrubbing techniques to combine and layer data from multiple sources and, process, and processes them through a live graphic interface. And in this work, it focuses on, the, on what we identified as the kind of four urban rights towards a socially just city, and those are food, health, learning, and mobility. And the map data is organized by census tract, and the map interface face uses near real time, um, sorry, and, um, and, and here you're seeing kind of two different tracts um, and uh, how the information is displayed. And you can actually see the disparity, if you can kind of read what's being scrolled on the, on the side, be between these two different census tracts, which are actually fairly close in the city, but there's huge disparities between, between income and, and, and population. This is um, the food overlay, which shows food deserts, which are identified as areas with low income combined with low access to healthy food within a half mile. And it also shows good quality grocery stores and five to 10 minute walking distances or what's known as food sheds. The health uh, overlays show data on health insurance coverage as well as the index of medical underservice. And the learning overlay combines multiple statistics um, that indicate tiers of learning disadvantage using a methodology developed by the Chicago Public Schools. And, um, and uh, and then the, um, there's several uh, mobility overlays, which, um, which, such as the percentage of households with vehicle ownership and the few high quality transit lines in the city, as well as boarding and alighting data um, for the city's transit service, which is the, what just popped up there. Um, and, uh, and, and through our research, we started to kind of develop a kind of combined um, weighting of these statistics to define what we call access hotspots, which are, or in-access hotspots, which are seen in red. And these are areas where there is acute low access to all categories um, in residential neighborhood and where people are drastically in need of these basic urban rights. And the tool also starts to map actors who deliver, who actually work to deliver access to food, health, learning, and mobility. And these actors are organizations, um, businesses, institutions, and places. And, um, and right now they're drawn from government data to indicate known actors. And the Google Map interface kind of helps visualize also the urban situation of these actors. However, we all know that data is incomplete. And, um, 
out of date or missing, uh, definitely missing some key community partners. So the tool also allows for individuals to contribute to um, add actors to the map. Oh, it just flipped back. Um, and, uh, and, um, and in this way, community members can participate um, on the creation of knowledge about local uh, places and people that are meaningful for delivering urban access in their neighborhood and as a way to kind of start to democratize the data-driven urban design process. So as I mentioned, the mappings reveal strategic places where need and capacity intersect and where speculative design prototypes um, for deployable urban infrastructures that provide access to social infrastructure are developed. And once um, these kind of sites of intervention, so we identified in this project about five sites of intervention, we approach the question of social infrastructure um, not, um, not through only uh, traditional infrastructural objects such as roads, highways, and buildings, but we start to look at um, what can be termed lightweight urban in instruments such as mobile, um, mobile technologies and community programs that operate through provisional and self-evolving dynamics and that leverage existing neighborhood community actors and NGOs. And for us, these are models of rapid urbanity that aim to stabilize and propel neighborhoods and kind of reinstate them as, as, as kind of these temporal actors within regional dynamics. This project in many ways learns uh, from um, a project by Cedric Price called the Detroit Think Grid, in which the design for a public educational institution is conceived as a multi-scalar, distributed complex of new and existing elements, pilot projects and entrepreneurial pro programs and practices that kind of co-op spaces on, in the city um, uh, through infrastructures um, and, uh, and, and, and kind of exist in kind of variable durations and levels of public engagement. We develop a toolbox of urban instruments as a set of playing cards that assemble a lexicon of lightweight, technologically enabled systemic interventions for urban space. These can be physical, like a bus stop or a playground, mobile, like a food truck or electric scooter, or ephemeral, like a Wi-Fi mesh network. We use the instrument cards both as tools for iteration in our own design work and for engagement with participant groups to enable visualization of what could be possible. So these are some kind of images of some of the public engagement we've done with students into DPS and also in other university-based workshops to kind of take the tool which is really um, easy to operate on for a whole range of different publics by virtue of familiarity with the Google Maps API um, and use it as a method to both prototype participatory mapping and access and interrogate the data that we're assembling on the platform. Within acutely underserved areas, and here we're back at Jefferson Chalmers, um, the mapping tool helps us identify both a geography of disadvantage and the local actors that we can imagine can be leveraged towards transforming the area. We identify strategic uh, locations where municipally or institutionally operated space, parking lots and street corners can serve as physical platforms, property, that can be redesigned to enable access to a broader variety of urban needs while also facilitating possibilities through the assemblage of these lightweight instruments to form new public spaces. For each instrument chosen relative to a specific site, we also identify the actors and agents that might be mobilized to provide support for this instrument in the specific neighborhood. And we consider, for example, how actors operating in disparate domains might be brought together and assembled uh, to collaborate. So here, in some ways, is a proposition about versions of public-private partnership where private interest overlays um, with public and NGO activity. And then we envision how the underutilized spaces can be physically redesigned through prototypical interventions such as new surfaces, roofs, spaces to gather in a kind of really simple typological way to re-envision this kind of idea of multi-use public space within the city that provides access to needs for a particular neighborhood. And so this design process is kind of prototyped um, and tested across multiple sites across the city. I think I, here we go. Um, and so this is uh, an example in the Brightwood, Brightmoor neighborhood on the west side of Detroit that um, Maria uh, uh, actually described quite um, poignantly this morning. 
And, um, and, and here, there, the, the, there's a, an acute loss of urban fabric as well as a burgeoning community-led uh, movement in urban agriculture. And the new instruments selected uh, here built on the community efforts to stabilize their own food insecurity um, and are combined in a hub for community-based food production, sharing spaces, safe spaces for children. And these are all assembled and um, redesigned in, a, in the space of a, of a city-owned lot that is now envisioned as a new space for community building, entrepreneurship, and amenity. And so the project um, develops uh, these kinds of prototypical, uh, what we call prototypical access enabling urban spaces, as well as this kind of acupunctural social infrastructure. And the intention is, and here's kind of, we kind of prototyped it through multiple sides in this parts of the city. Um, and, and intended, it's intended to operate systematically across the city, but not only um, uh, look at designers' um, capacity to describe what and why, but also how, and how do these, how could these um, kinds of projects come uh, to, to life? And so to summarize, um, design for us in the deindustrialized de territory lies within the propositional scenarios by which the permanence and long duration of physical infrastructure is leveraged to provide social infrastructure, either through more, um, you know, much more larger and uh, larger urban artifacts at the scale of the mega region or at the scale of a city like Detroit through more provisional and lightweight urban instruments. And so in each case, the kind of process of mapping, identifying actors and describing frameworks through which propositions might materialize is, is the kind of core act of design. Okay, is this on? Yeah. So I think, thank you for all of those presentations. Those were great. Maybe to, um, maybe to buck the trend of the non-standard discussion session, let's have a standard discussion session up here. And maybe I'll just ask one or two questions uh, and then hand it over to the audience. I'll start throwing the catch box around. Um, so I'm gonna ask a question that I think you've each um, actually answered in different ways in your presentation, but it's a kind of zoomed out question um, that I'd like to ask anyway, just to kind of put, put a point on, on the positions here since this is the kind of design panel. Um, I think we, we established pretty early on in, um, in this conference that vacancy is not emptiness, that vacancy can be full of, of kind of narrative, of invisible systems, maybe of qualities, uh, and we established that vacancy or leftover spaces often have kind of uh, resilient meaning for, for local communities. Uh, so what I'm wondering is if you all, as, as designers, believe that designers and the kind of capacities of the designer have a kind of unique capability or maybe even a unique responsibility to identify opportunity or latent possibility mm -hmm. within these kinds of vacant uh, fallow spaces? Mm -hmm. uh, and if so, um, and I think I know everybody's answer, but and if so, how do you reconcile that with the kind of mandate and necessity to be um, you know, sensitive and responsible to local communities that might not have your vision or your understanding mm -hmm. of the possible? Well, Go ahead and grab the box. Okay, I think we're mic. Oh, okay. We don't need the <laughs> we don't need the box. I think that would cause like feedback. But um, I think uh, so. So the first answer is is yes. I think there are in all these sites there are latent um, capacities. I think that um, people who live in these places actually know um, what they are. And part of the role of the designer is, I, I think one of our roles is to kind of um, uh, materialize these into kind of, you know, into kind of forms of communication that can be um, communicated to, um, to broader constituencies, not only, not only to play it back to the constituents themselves, because they might have partial visions. They have very, you know, often very strong visions, but sometimes they are partial. Um, but also to 
um, other uh, um, larger bodies that and and uh, uh, others outside of the community, um, government, you know, uh, government uh, that may not be able to see that, and and people who kind of start to make decisions and other kinds of of maps that map the these areas as empty or that map the, you know, the way that um, city planners, and I'm not blaming city planners, I think there's a lot of sensitive city planners who also share in this, but, but there are city planners and governments that, that create maps that say, you know, we're gonna read, you know, this is gonna be, this is gonna be all green, just like the, the Detroit Future City map, or this is gonna right. be landscape. And so part of the role of the designers is to kind of um, materialize these stories. Um, but then I think when possibilities emerge, you know, and then, and then to kind of vision possibilities, and that's why for us it's important not to only make those images of what it could be, but to kind of start to create a roadmap to how it can be sustained, who could, who could support it, who the champions could be, who's local on the ground that yeah. would need to gather around this. And so I think the role of design in, 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 um, in kind of, uh, is, is also about kind of finding the local agency and bringing it in as part of the project because it's not always apparent um, what, yeah. what is there, so. Yeah, yeah I mean, yes. yes. And then the second answer, I think, how to balance that, I mean, for me, it was, it's just to listen, frankly. Like, the, and to, to listen actually takes a lot of time. But I think in all of the proposals, like everything that's in that proposal was all some, like all of the things that, that ended up in those, in each proposal um, was something that was mentioned by someone at some point in time during the process. And rather than trying to spend a lot of time negotiating those differences and trying to make a proposal that fit to, to my idea of like a, a kind of sound proposal, I actually wanted to just throw all of it onto the table and allow for frustrations and, and um, different needs to kind of like converge at one, in, in one site. Um, and to accept the fact that like, it's always going to be messy, there's always going to be multiple stakeholders, there's always going to be multiple narratives like overlaid onto one site. So rather than try to solve all of them or, um, or make everyone happy, I think it was about trying to find some kind of middle ground that I think, um, that I think um, where, where everyone could coexist. Um, and so really it was just about listening being patient. I think the key word um, was, is capacities, um, the latent capacities, because I think um, uh, there's, for me, there's a big difference to have um, folks kind of say what it can be, and it's really kind of, I don't know, I feel kind of like some of them are just a holding pattern, you know, in their, and, it, it, and they have such a sh short, span, and I think those are fine, but what I'm not really seeing yet, um, I think in Detroit are some of these that, that are, are looking for a longer trajectory, you know, and, and one that kind of truly says we're in the next cycle of this city. We're not just kind of like waiting. By that you mean communities or, or design propositions or and just thinking of all the, I'm not going to swear. Uh, you can. All of the rain gardens. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, I, I mean, those are all fine and good. You know, but I, I don't know. I, I look at some some of those things, and I, I'm just I'm just feeling like you know they're a way to kind of take the sting mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. You know, and like I said, that's that's fine. You know, but it's it's just sort of like when are you gonna write? It's kind of like oh, I'm going in and I'll go to a physical therapist and you know they'll make my back feel better for a day. You know, versus someone that is really diagnosing. Yeah, but you I know, mean, just to put a little bit more of a point on it, um, towards uh, you as well, Julie, because you're yeah. the one that you're the one here that showed realized work, and yeah. I, I found the presentation after. Um, after a day of fascinating and wonderful presentations, refreshingly different in that it showed spaces and projects that were realized. And in doing that, it put an aesthetic project on the table, mm -hmm. uh, a project that was often about kind of revealing, revealing narrative uh, that used sites as kinds of um, you know, places that are, that are a bit of an archeology span that yeah. uncover, that kind of lean into the fallow. Um, 
and again, for me as a designer, it was refreshingly aesthetic, refreshingly spatial. But I have to imagine you work in places where that aesthetic and that spatiality is at odds with what the surrounding community might want to see there. Yeah. I mean, I, I, always, I always think about, you know, I always think about, I often quote and show, you know, the work of Peter Latz and Latz and Partners, you know, in the Roar, Duisburg Nord, and, the, and, the, and how he deployed gardens as a way to summon people into the unfamiliar with the familiar. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I think that's very strong, you know, and I, I always kind of have that in mind. I mean, th those trees are dogwood trees. What? I use dogwood trees, you know, it, and you know, and but it's all for you know this this kind of like you know uh, grounded familiar thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll turn it out um, uh, to the audience. Uh, again, since this is the design panel, I want to ask a question um, about representation and maybe as a couple of points of departure for it. Well, um, first, after Scott talking about the kind of um, maybe map malaise that, that we get in a conference like this um, by the end, that's, that's one point of departure. Another point of departure would be Jeff's question about um, drawings or images that are meant to, uh, meant to enroll more of a public imagination. Uh, and then I, I was struck uh, in the, the first answer, Kathy, how you talked about, um, I think you, you were talking about similar things, maps and, and drawings that uh, were about communication. And that, for me, that was um, a little, I understand what you mean, but it was also a little perplexing because I think between some of your, some of the RVTR maps and also in the, um, in Cyrus and your maps, so often the kind of intensity in those things seem to me that they're much less about communication, they're much less about content than they are about some sort of an affect of abundance. Like they, they seem to work much more on an aesthetic level than they do on, um, you know, they're, they're not the maps that USGS would make and they're not the ones that Ed Tufty would tell you to make either. So I wonder about that, like to what extent can you and are you engaging in uh, a representational project, a mapping project that's more about anticipating aesthetic futures than it is about communicating to um, readers? I think that's an interesting question. Like, um, at least for me, the kind of, and I think it's true that there's a kind of affect of abundance. I think that um, has an aesthetic, it manifests aesthetically, but I think it's ideological and I think it's related to even the attitude of trying to reveal abundance in the projects through the mapping exercise, trying to communicate visually and then <laughs> providing these kind of exhaustive texts, identifying every agent, what their capacity is, what their current cost per unit is, all these kinds of other layers of data like in the uh, second project that show up to represent um, a kind of roadmap, but written in a three-point font, so that you really have to get into, you know, something that's this big to read some some scrap of detail. And I think it's it's like a, it's related to the the ethic of circularity. So in the kind of moment right now of the circular of the emergence of the priority of the circular economy, the, that identifying abundance in whatever form that might take, which might include. Uh, like readings of abundance that are not necessarily traditionally held as positive as a way to identify and reveal what the undergirding kind of material is to produce the project, for me is part of the kind of excess of some of the detailing in the maps. Um, and it's about what can the, how can the maps like produce their own excess as a way of communicating. So it's not about, let's say, the immediacy of legibility as a priority versus how to, how, to, how to produce something that can communicate in a short duration, but it also invites multiple durations of engagement with a thing, I would say. Yeah. Maybe communication, if it, if it yeah, I, I think I used it in a kind of more loose sense as, as, as a kind of, as, as a, in a rhetorical way, that it, it, you know, it does communicate that this is not a simple story. There's a complex layered narrative that is not something that can be digested easily. It's kind of, you know, it, 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 it pushes, you know, the map pushes back on you. So that, that 
in, in, when I say communicate, I don't mean that it, you know, it's necessarily instrumentalized towards, uh, towards some kind of clear, um, a, a kind of simpler, clear story. Yeah, I think with the, <clears throat> with the um, internet project, there's a, always an assumption that um, digital means immaterial or that there's, there's like, you know, it's data so it doesn't have, have like a physical presence. And I think the maps are really trying to use like abundance to actually, like as a kind of aesthetic technique to actually show you that there's a lot of stuff here and it actually does have physical consequences. It affects how, how these, in this case, like how these high school students are moving through the city, like how they access certain, um, how they access information, how they um, find resources throughout their neighborhood. Like it actually does affect their physical environment. And so the maps are really trying to show that. And also with the, with the kind of Instagram, you know, all the little like the Q and A and, the, and my choice to represent all of the different accounts that they look at and what they're experiencing online, you know, that's also to show that the data is fleeting, you know, that it changes at, you know, on a daily basis, like what their interests are, what they're looking at. And so the map is also trying to show you that the data is not as fixed as maybe some other mapping techniques might um, assume or suggest. Thanks. Do we have questions in the audience? <laughs> Thank you for handing it to me. Okay, this is an amazing panel, and uh, <clears throat> my question is primarily for, uh, for Jeff and Kathy, uh, uh, you know, building on the, one, the amazing uh, map mapping that you've done. Uh, I had to kind of uh, put, you know, put your presentation, in fact, the whole panel this afternoon, uh, in conjunction with the panel this morning on production of decline and the maps that Josh showed and Eric Seymour and so on. And I, you know, something in me both wants to combine these two and wants to keep them separate. In other words, uh, on the one hand, you know, this is, you know, what we heard this morning was the truth and, you know, and some, some very basic truth. On the other hand, when we're looking forward, when we're looking to, you know, maybe we should just ignore all of that. And, in other words, uh, you know, in other words, there's something paralyzing about knowing that past. So, uh, I, you know, I, I guess I'm, you know, I'm, I'm foisting my, my, own, my own difficulties onto you, but, uh, you know, in other words, I wondered if you too had seen, you know, had thought about this issue of, you know, of these different kinds of mappings and if you saw any way to combine them in a fruitful way? Um, well, yeah. <laughs> so, the, I mean, one of the, sure. I think one of the commonalities across groups of people working in kind of urban questions who are utilizing mapping as a primary mode of investigation and revelation has to do with a, a, a really, serious kind of question about how one prioritizes the information that's being encoded, prioritized, how it's made legible, how frontal it is. Um, but it's also, so, and, and, and I think it almost goes into some sort of bifurcation. I hate that it does go into bifurcation, but it goes into a thing that in US academic circles, we tend to operate particularly within frameworks undergirded by like ac academic theory, or sorry, architectural theory within academia is we tend to polarize positions. So we'd start with a framework about revelation and, and that the revealing of content might be somehow separated from the proposing of alternate futures and that, that one might be optimistic while one might be disconcerting or limiting in our capacity to see the future. And one of the aspirations, at least in the kind of Google API tool for us, was to think about what is the technological platform that's most easily accessible by the <laughs> widest range of people that would allow them to, um, with fairly simple overlays of information, a, uh, access a pretty rich depth, and I was really impressed by what Josh and his team were putting together, but a pretty rich depth of information that at the same time would also constitute a kind of minimal amount of content in order to, to allow you to participate relatively rapidly in a particular discussion that uh, on the one hand is agnostic about use, but that earnestly we actually imagine is being used to propose alternate futures. So there's like, you know, there, there's a bias in terms of how you, uh, 
perceive the world. And there's, you know, so that if, you, if I, this is going to be scary, but I don't know, those of you who are wearing the D on your jacket for self-confessed design characters might, in fact, inherently have some sort of optimistic uh, predisposition and tendency to propose alternate futures that's encoded into your day-to-day -day DNA. Not that that prevents you from being critical, but... I think, but, but I think that, I mean, both, we, we also, like Joshua, read, read Lefebvre, and, and so I'd sure. like to kind of think about it as, well, if, if he's talking about the production of decline, how can we rethink of the, like, the production of transformation? And so yeah. it's not just uh, a kind of about a vision, but it's actually, well, how is that produced? And, and that, how is that produced both through kind of spatial practices, but also um, uh, kind of financial instruments and legal instruments, as well as, as well as design practices. So it's actually part of a much more complex apparatus that produces transformation as opposed to just a vision. So that's um, how we think about it. Just a, a two cents here that I, I, I would say, you know, it'd be great to combine them and I'd actually like it to go all the way back to <coughs> pre-settlement yeah. hi history. I, I think there's just, what I find is there's, a, you know, an, right, an amazing impatience, you know, in the world. And I, I, I think if, you know, folks, you know, strapped on a watch that was more geological time, you know, and knew that and could see that, they'd appreciate how, um, how, you know, really, if you think about it, industry is a blip on the screen, you know, on the geological thing. And, and this kind of boom and bust cycle is just that, it's just a cycle, you know. So anyway, I'm just interested in doing that a lot, of time, a lot. and I find communities are kind of are taken aback because they're like, they, they need to put it into a, into a, a, a broader, deeper, you know, and, there, and then, then there's that perspective then of, of what time is it, you know? So um, thank you all three for all three presentations. They're all um, really interesting. I wonder, there's a question that I have that I think perhaps is more, <coughs> excuse me, more for Kathy and Jeff and for Cyrus, which has to do with um, what it means to make things legible. So I think we tend to have this sense as designers that you know, if we make things legible, that's a good thing, and that we're gonna maybe piggybacking a little bit on what Jeff said, that we have the somewhat optimistic sense that like, by making things legible, we're empowering the right people. And I wonder a little bit, one of the things that's um, so exciting about Detroit in some ways is the sort of like community bottom-up innovations that have occurred because, precisely because the city has not been legible for so long. So when you go in and you kind of excavate connections or you make legible like sort of these larger connections through you know, putting data sets together, do you have any sort of concern or were there any moments in your projects where you were concerned that that may have sort of unintended side effects or make things legible to the wrong people? Well, if you're in the business of making legi things legible, you don't get to choose who reads the, the tea leaves that you've produced and displayed. So. I mean, that, 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 that could always be a kind of question, but I, I don't know. I think the, for me that part of the issue of making legible goes beyond the specific product of the graphical um, representation that's a product of the scholarship and the design effort. You know, the reason why I asked the question to the previous group about like the duration of public communication is because I'm being con currently convinced that more and more the kind of, um, the potential to operate through outwardly facing public communications of design, especially in this kind of work, which is partial discovery, partial proposition, is really potent. And so for me, the kind of exhibition, and again, which to which audience, that's a challenge, but like the kind of projecting outward to influence broad constituencies is, is core to the kind of, at least for me, the aspirations of the work. And I, and, I, and I would say that, you know, in some, some orbits, it might be more critical than to build the work, to demonstrate or to execute the things physically. Not that that's not a great feeling for anybody who designs and makes things, but for me, it's like the production of new uh, perceptions around the possibilities of the world or the, the production of available app, moments of apprehension around what the context of one's lived uh, uh, circumstance is 
that, that's like a successful outcome of design from our perspective. That's like a, it's an end in and of itself as, a, uh, as opposed to a, a, a stand-in for some other future operations. Yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> um, throughout the process, I was trying to be very sensitive to um, how the data was being used, especially when I was meeting with like residents in Detroit and who are already skeptical of you know institutional kind of research on you know the city. And so um, I think that uh, I was always trying to um, yeah be careful with how that data was being used, but also kind of at times like revealing things, but also sort of burying other data, like in the kind of, I hate to go back to the aesthetics of abundance, like burying data within this kind of like melange of content to, to allow like many different audiences to access it in their own way. And so, you know, the maps, they present, they're kind of legible, but also kind of not, you know, like the, they're, they, the, the de data points are kind of precise, but kind of not. Like I, I think that there's always some effort to operate in that space between legibility and illegibility. I think it's kind of, and I think it's productive, I think, for this project. Okay, we have Mona, and then maybe Scott. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, these were really three super ex exciting projects that you presented. There are two keywords that I would like to um, discuss maybe a little bit further. So, Julie, you mentioned um, urban curation. That was one of, or a curatorial strategy that was one of in your slides. Mm -hmm. And then I think Casio said something about um, designing the transformation. And I have the feeling that in all of the projects that you discussed today, there are a lot of stakeholders involved and potentially a lot of designers. So specifically, um, the work that you presented uh, at the end, um, Jeff and Cassie, it's reminded me a lot of the work that Raul Bunshorten is doing, um, the head of Cora. And he coined the term the urban gallery. And there is an intentional component that these prototypes that are featured here through the game cards, and he's also using the game cards and the workshops and stakeholder involvement, et cetera. But at the end of the day, it's also important that, <clears throat> A, because of time, that these game cards are handed over to other designers that are testing these prototypes because, um, I mean, it would be great if you could design all of them, but it's also cool to share the yeah. uh, design assignment. And it also has something to do with that the city is extremely diverse and it needs to be diverse. So we need a lot of authors that are participating in these projects. We need a lot of stakeholders like the church and the library who are yeah. joining into making the network. We need a lot of people joining into making the landscape. So the curatorial questions, how could this actually create a manifestation in material forms afterwards? Um, I, I think I understand what, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the question is, but maybe I, I, I'll just. I think it's a comment somehow, yeah. okay. but also the idea of where you're thinking about a curatorial Well, the strategy. way that we're, yeah, it, it was kind of explicit with the, um, with the, what we call, we called them the kind of prototypes, all the kind of, um, in, and the drawings with the kind of yellow, which were the, the urban, urban prototypes, because we were, we had a lot of conversations about specificity versus genericness, and how could we make it, how could you make something that's both site and program specific, but was in a kind of generic language because it recognized that the project was not the very specific detailed design, but it was more in the kind of assembly, um, the kind of strategic, um, you know, the a, a kind of st a strategic um, uh, kind of identification of kind of surfaces and prototypical elements like roofs and. And, but really kind of left the design question kind of purposefully open. So that was our kind of way of, of, of kind of uh, addressing that because we do, yeah, the goal wasn't to have a very specific design of, of, of any of those um, kind of propositions, but to kind of test them out as, as both processes and, and possibilities. And it's not, like, it's not prescriptive, and it, it's a kit that could be added to because it doesn't imagine that it's exhausted the ingredients. So it's purposefully about kind of disseminating a strategy and then hoping others will take it over. We got a call in the office from Singapore uh, six months after that very first iteration of that project started asking for all the stuff. And so we sent them the stuff, 
And there's a, a project that got built actually uh, for a kind of bu bus stop that's a library beside a local public school that was, you know, that we handed over the thoughts in an early stage to someone. They were like, yeah, we saw it on the website and we thought it was cool. Have you designed one yet? We were like, no, we're working on the cards. <laughs> so it was like, so anyway, it's, 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 it's intended to be open and used. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm afraid we're out of time, so Scott's question will have to be for the reception. But thank you all again. Yeah.